Hey there, out in Arts Bellevue land. My name's Lee Jones, and tonight I have a guest. Um, her name is Lisa Dordal. She is a writer in residence at Vanderbilt University. She has a new book out. It's uh, This is perfect timing to have her on the show um, and talk about her new book. She's been on a book tour the last few weeks, and um, I want, we're going to do some readings tonight from her new books of uh, book of poems. And um, Lisa, I want to inter introduce yourself and go ahead and tell us uh, all about yourself. So thank you so much for having me on the show, Lee. This is this is fabulous. I am a poet and a teacher based here in, in Nashville. I've been teaching in the English department at Vanderbilt since 2011, when I, which is when I finished my MFA in poetry. Um, and I teach a wide variety of, of classes, sometimes a, um, a poetry workshop where the students write poems. But um, my favorite favorite class to teach is a poetry survey class, Introduction to Poetry. Um, I feel like a little bit like a poetry evangelist because I think, I believe very strongly that there's a poem out there for everyone or a poet for everyone. Um, so I teach and then I'm also a poet. Um, and I consider myself to be a bit of a late bloomer in terms of of writing poetry. I wrote a lot in high school and college just to kind of get through high school and college. Um, but I didn't write much in my 20s. Um, and then in my late 30s, something really started bubbling up um, inside of me. And I went back to school at the age of 45 to get my MFA. Um, and I've been writing you know, seriously ever since. And I had my first book came out in 2018. Um, Mosaic of the Dark, that was 2018. And then just this month, uh, oops, uh, Water Lessons has come out. So that's a little bit about who I am and what I do. So you enjoyed poetry, you just were not really into writing until so, what you were inspired by? So I, I grew up in a very math and science family. And so I don't think it ever really occurred to me growing up that this was something you could, you know, kind of make a living at. Um, I, and then, so I, I, I wrote a lot in high school and college, as I said, to sort of, I think I probably had undiagnosed depression and that was a way to kind of deal with that. Um, and then in my late 30s, I went to divinity school. I went to the Vanderbilt Divinity School and got an MDiv. And that's when things really kind of bubbled up inside of me. Um, in, in my biblical studies classes, one of the things that was really kind of drilled into us was when you read a biblical text, ask who who is speaking in the text, who is in the center, who is in the margins, who has kind of power, who doesn't have power, who has voice, who doesn't. And so in my late 30s, when I was in this program, I started writing poems in which I creatively kind of reimagined some of these biblical stories in which women appeared, but just on the margins. Um, and then after I finished my MDiv program, I started, um, that's when I started kind of asking those same questions about my own life you know, in the, in the time that I grew up, who had, who had power, who had voice in the family I grew up in. Um, I grew up in a family with pretty traditional gender, um, gender divisions. And so that's when I really started writing poetry and I audited workshops through the MFA program for several years. And then at the age of 45 actually applied and, um, yeah, so it's been a, it's been, it's been kind of hidden in me, kind of tucked away. Sometimes I, um, I think of myself as coming out of the closet as a poet in my late thirties, early forties, because that's kind of what it felt like. Well, your your um, biblical text, you know, has always been taught as uh, as wonderful uh, study. You know, it's it contains a lot of beautiful, eloquent prose, and you know, it's a it's a good study. So that's a good place to to learn from yes yes absolutely there's so much in it there's so much in the bible <laughs> you know there's poetry there's narrative there's yeah it's it's pretty incredible so what what did you um who who did you like when you were uh growing up who did who were your favorites 
Who were your favorites then and who are your favorites now? In terms of poetry? Mm -hmm. So I really did not read much um, except, I mean, read much poetry when I was growing up, except for whatever was um, assigned to me. And so I, I do remember um, in high school English, the teacher reading uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock out loud to us by T.S. Eliot, and I was completely blown away. But I really didn't read much poetry. And I think it was because I had this very kind of naive and erroneous <laughs> assumption that if I read poetry, I won't be able to find my own poetic voice, which is completely wrong. But what the poet that really um, kind of helped me, kind of, almost kind of gave me permission to do what I'm doing is the poet Jane Kenyon. And she's someone I started reading in my probably early, early 40s, really. Um, and she writes in a very kind of simple um, style, but very profound poems. And um, she really was kind of the gateway poet. And then the other the other poets that I love and go back to again and again, Marie Howe, who um, writes a lot about her brother um, died of AIDS. She writes a lot about that, a lot about that grief. And she also incorporates a lot of biblical images and allusions into her poetry, which really resonate with me. Um, and in, even though I'm not writing poems that are specifically about someone in the Bible, I'm, I'm always kind of in conversation with, or often in conversation with different stories in the Bible. So I go back to her again and again. Um, and then Natasha Trethaway is another poet. Um, I teach both of these poets, Natasha Trethaway and Marie Howe. And Natasha Trethaway, um, her, um, her poems really resonate with me. She writes a lot about the loss of her, the death of her mother. Her mother was actually murdered. Um, and even though the death of the circumstances of my mother's death are not similar to that, um, that there's still so much in her poetry that really resonates with me. So those are the, those are the kind of the top three. And, you know, there's a bunch, lots of other ones too, Ellen Bass, Sharon Olds, lots of other poets, but um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I grew up reading, you know, the, the classics, the old, old stuff. Um, the first poem I remember I really liked was Birches by Robert Frost. Yes. Yeah. That's it just a good one. In such imagery. Um, yeah. It just, it just kind of takes you away and puts you in a, in a place where, you know, if you were just sitting there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think about, but you know, it, it's oh, yeah. a place and, and, um, uh, reading your book right off the, the, the start, you know, take, takes, uh, takes you away to a place you uh -huh. never thought you would go. And I, I just, I really love that about poetry and, and poetry can mm -hmm. be layered. It can create visuals. It can create, uh, deep, uh, you know, deep thoughts and, and be, um, kind of therapeutic. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and people, you know, every poet, every poem means something a little different, depending on who's reading it. And that's kind of, kind of the beauty of it. Kind of like, like people talk about the, the Bible as being a living text in the sense that it, you know, doesn't have this fixed meaning because we're constantly bringing meaning to it. And that's the same thing with poetry. Um, whoever is reading it is bringing something to that poem that's going to change how that poem is understood. And I, there's poems that I've read, you know, at one part of my life and then again later, and I see something different. So yeah, it's this constant kind of opening up of meaning. And I love Robert Frost. I love Robert Frost. Um, where have you been on your book tour? I know you've been on. Uh... So yeah, I put together a, a book tour. Um, I have so far, I've been to New Orleans. Um, New York City, that was April 2nd, New Orleans the week before that. And then I, I went to Minnesota um, where it, it was snowing. <laughs> this was just last week and it was snowing. I left the spring of Nashville to go to the winter of Minneapolis. Um, and then this weekend, I'm going to Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'll be going to Chicago in May. Originally, I had scheduled eight different cities to go to. But three of those switched to virtual readings, um, which is fine because it's pretty packed. The schedule is pretty packed. Um, 
so yeah it's it's been fun the thing about scheduling a book tour is um like i could call up any bookstore in the country and say hey i'm a i'm a writer poet i want to do a reading in the bookstore and the first question they're going to ask is how are you going to get people here because i'm not i'm not you know famous so um you really have to be strategic so i tend to pick cities where i know people um either where i have family or a lot of friends or um there are lots of poetry se reading series out there. So I might um, contact a reading series, but yeah, I definitely have to be strategic with it. Well, that that's like uh, my friends that are um, songwriters or performers, you know, you have to, you know, if you go on a, a small tour, you have to know people um, or they yeah. just are like, who are you? Um, Absolutely. I already have a question about uh, so someone says, love the imagery reference, any experience with songwriting? Do I have any experience with songwriting? No, I have zero experience with songwriting, except when I went to um, New Orleans for, it was actually part of a conference. Um, and so I was on a couple panels reading poetry, but the song singer songwriter, Mary Gaucher, who um, I had never heard of, but my wife said, you have to go hear her. She's amazing. Great. Great. So yeah. she's amazing. And sh so she was talking about, songwriting and i just saw so many so many connections you know she kept saying hey songwriters only have four minutes we gotta move fast you know and we gotta just focus on just distill those those really key images that that um a, a lot of the same principles really that you don't need to say everything but you need to say enough that people get what you're what you're talking about and understand the the emotion behind the images yeah, it seems like with poetry, you probably have a little more, um, you have a little more um, free reign with with illusions and with imagery. Um, songwriting, they kind of, you know, they want you to have a, a beginning, middle and end. You know, right. Which poetry does as can as well. But. Um, but you, yeah, you're not restricted to four minutes. That's for sure. Right. right yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So tell us about your um, the inspiration for Water Lessons. So a lot of the poems in here. Oh, yeah, I can hold it up, too. Yeah. So just to kind of give a description overview, there are um, a lot of poems in here about my mother's alcoholism and eventual death, um, my father's deepening dementia, my own childlessness. And then against the backdrop of these personal griefs, I look at the patriarchal underpinnings of the world that I grew up in and also my own complicity in systemic racism as a white girl growing up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and then also kind of hovering within a lot of the, or we've woven through a lot of the poems, um, there are reflections and allusions to a, a divine presence that for me is both keenly felt and also necessarily elusive. You know, there's that tension between here and not here, um, faith and doubt, all of that is kind of woven into these poems, the tension between reality and imagination. I have several poems in here about um, like an imagine, imaginary daughter. Um, and even though I never had children, um, that daughter feels so real on the page, you know? So there's really a lot in here about the power of imagination. Um, but in terms of what inspired me to write this book, so uh, there are certainly some themes in here that are a continuation of the themes I grappled with in Mosaic of the Dark. There, a lot of the poems in Mosaic of the Dark are about um, my own journey coming out as a lesbian, about my mother's possibly non-heterosexual orientation and about her alcoholism. Um, so, and I thought after I wrote that book, I would be done with my mother, but I'm not, I'm never going to be done with my mother. And it's, um, and I love writing about her because even though I'm writing about painful experiences or painful memories, um, I always feel her presence when I'm writing. So, so that's some of the poems. And then, um, 
you know, that's kind of just an ongoing inspiration. And then in terms of the, oh, and then I, I, there's also poems, as I said, about my dad's dementia and then the childlessness, which are things that have just kind of bubbled up more recently. So they're in the book. And then um, I have been, the poems about race um, really were inspired by um, a lot of work I've been doing or trying to do in the last four or five years, um, thanks mainly to the, the Unitarian Universalist Church that I belong to, First UU, um, that's really been kind of encouraging me to, all of us to, um, in the congregation, to think more about what systemic racism is and how it operates. And so, for example, there's one poem in here about the Pippi Longstocking books and how um, I had no idea how problematic they are. That I grew up reading Pippi Longstocking, um, but I heard an NPR interview, um, and I don't remember who was being interviewed. I, I was I caught just a part of it, but a black scholar who was saying um, the Pippi Longstocking books are just completely racist, um, and I was shocked. And um, but I knew that I should really be listening to this person. So when I got home from my errands, I read the book, and um, I was horrified by what. I read. Um, and so, so there's experiences like that, you know, the, the poems have come from inspirations such as like that. Yeah. So this is a long, long span of time that you're writing about. Like, yes, 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 what, absolutely. What age would you say you, you first had the, the memory of wanting to start at and go forward so that is so interesting because some of these poems, um, there's a whole group of poems in here called postcards from the 70s. And so I'm talking there about, you know, some experiences I had as a as a kid. Um, so you're right, like the span is really, really long. But I think one of the one of the things I'm grappling with in the book is are, we are never fixed selves. You know, there's this, we all have um, a certain kind of fluidity. There's the, the self is not completely fixed. Um, so my mother, for example, um, was both present and absent, um, you know, depending on whether or not she had been drinking. My father with his dementia is both present and absent. Um, I, you know, there's so many ways in which I understand myself differently now than I did at other points in my life. So there's a lot in the book about the fluidity of self, the fluidity of how we understand ourselves and how we understand other people. And I think that um, this kind of gets a little bit to like the sequencing of the book because I there is kind of a loose narrative arc in terms of, you know, starting with poems about my mother. She died in 2001 and ending with poems about um, my dad's dementia. But um, but I didn't want to group all the poems about a particular topic together because that's not how life works. You know, we don't just have these, okay, this is my, these are my mother years. These are my father years. Um, life is just so much more kind of fluid and um, complex than that. So the past, the past is never really gone, you know, things, memories keep popping up. And um, so, so it's interesting. Yes, it is a wide span of time, but I think that's really reflective of how we move through the world, you know, and we don't, we don't let go of our past completely. So, so the poems are, uh, would, would you say they're in chronological order? Or do you so kind of, um... they're, it's very rough chronological order. Um, I knew, so the first section of the book is is mostly about my mom my, and her alcoholism. Um, but I knew I didn't want to put every single poem in there about my mom. I wanted, because she keeps coming back. She keeps coming back in my life. Um, and I purposely end that first section of the book with, my mother arriving, my mother leaving, my mother not going away, which then kind of foreshadows, okay, she's going to be returning um, in the rest of the book. And the second section of the book, that's the postcard section, postcards from the 70s, which is 
about a lot of experiences I had as a as a kid, and especially in terms of um, race and gender. And so those experiences were just as formative to who I am now as the experience of growing up with an alcoholic parent. So I knew I wanted to have those poems early in the book. And then after that, I mean, I struggled a lot with, you know, individual poems. Should I put this one first, that one first, um, or, you know, before this one or after that one. But I knew that I wanted to start with my mother and then end with um, the poem called I Love, which is about, well, about love and about my wife and kind of where I am now. So, um, yeah, that's kind of a long answer, but. Good deal. Well, let's, um, let's, let's read some then. Okay. Um, we're going to read, um, uh, Lisa's going to read three of, uh, the poems in the first uh, pages of the book and you can go ahead and introduce those and, and read those for us. Okay. So this, this first poem, the first poem of the book is called welcome. Um, and I wrote this poem back in 2017. I was attending a, a big writing conference in DC and um, AWP, which some, some people out there might know, but um, it's a huge writing conference, 10,000 people. I get very overwhelmed at it, but what I do is I go to as many sessions as I can during the day, and then I go back to the hotel and just zone out in front of the TV. Um, and so this particular hotel where I was staying had one of those welcome channels on the TV. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, uh, as you will see in the poem, I started getting increasingly kind of freaked out by <laughs> this woman on the welcome channel. And when I, I wrote the poem um, on my way back from the conference and I showed it to my wife when I got home and because I had been telling her, you know, in our chats during the evening, I'm getting kind of freaked out by this woman on the welcome channel. And she said, um, oh my God, <laughs> I didn't know you were that freaked out by the woman in the welcome channel. So this is called Welcome. Flipping the remote, I keep landing on the hotel's welcome channel. Hello, a woman says, white woman, pretty smile. May I have a minute of your time? Be as alert as you are at home, she says. Pretty woman, concerned for my safety. She keeps walking towards me there behind everything else, like fear behind the eyes. I keep flipping, taking in the news of the week. People are protesting in the streets. This pussy fights back. No ban, no wall. Never invite strangers into your room. Pretty smile, pretty woman, as pretty as my mother was when she was alive, pretty as she was in my dream. Be alert, the woman says, as alert as you are at home. I never knew on Tuesdays what she'd look like. My mother, who drove to the Del Mar College of Hair Design to get dolled up cheap by a stranger, Sometimes large, loopy curls, other times tight and small, tucked in like something sleeping. Use the viewport, the woman says, if someone knocks on your door. Hepburn chestnut one week to a sassy blonde the next. In the dream, she is reading from my book. She looks happy. Keep the doors and windows locked, the woman says. In five pages, my mother will be dead. First, the bottles hidden in bookcases throughout the house. Then the heart wing, locked, the woman says, at all times. My mother glances up. She is reading in the voice she used for Sounder and the Chronicles of Narnia. She reads as if the woman she is will not die, as if the woman who dies will not be her, as if she is not even there. Like when she learned about my attempts, aspirin, then the knife, my hand like Abraham's over Isaac. Nice story, my mother said. We had learned to slip out of ourselves, to squeeze our consciousness through a hole the size of a dime. We were small inside our bodies. My body is sin, she told me once. Be alert, the woman says, as alert as you are at home. Nice story, she said. So that's that one. Should I go ahead and read the other two? Sure. Okay. So the other one, uh, also in the first section, is called Grief. 
This is on page 11. There will be days when the word mother will burst out of you like the black smoke of a squid, a fire deep inside water. Anyone can become animal or a flicker of light. Remember, infinity means unfinished and time doesn't move at the same speed for everyone. Remember, mother contains not just the sea, but the darkness of the sea, and there is no such thing as a half-life for grief. Even oceans contain waterfalls, and your mother is inside everything that you write, sometimes as melody, sometimes as mountain or bone. Every time you hear the word, you become something else. And then um, this poem uh, is called Ars Poetica, which is, uh, it means the art of poetry. And an Ars Poetica poem is is, is a poem that often gives insight into um, a writer's preoccupations or obsessions, why it is they, they do what they do. My mother is saying something I still can't hear, and I want to believe there is a door. Sometimes I dream I am being led through darkness, and I wouldn't call her death natural. So many rooms were closed off before we knew they were there, and I was the one no one believed. And my father still insists her liver was fine. It was her heart, he says, just her heart. So those are three from the from the first section. Well, I like starting off with the with the welcome because I was uh -huh. I, was, I was wondering, you know, is is this uh, is this your welcome? to uh mm -hmm. the book okay. exactly was this mm -hmm. the was this what you experienced that first put you on that journey for this book um, well yeah it's funny because that this welcome poem is the very first poem i wrote for this book and i even um i wrote it and my other mosaic of the dark wasn't out yet it was coming out a year later and i even wrote to the um the the, my publisher and I said, I just wrote another poem. Can I please stick it into the mosaic of the dark manuscript? And they said, no, 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 we're too far along in the, in the process, but you know, save it for another book. So, um, and that was back in the day when I thought, okay, I've written one book. I don't know if I'm ever going <laughs> to, if I have another book in me and which I think is common um, to feel that way after you've written <laughs> one book, like, wow, how can I do this again? But anyway, yeah, that ended up. And so it works really nicely as mm -hmm. um, the, the welcome to the book, welcome to kind of some of the main themes in the book. Um, and it's also the first poem I wrote for this manuscript. Well, also, you were saying that you were you were kind of, uh, you know, I've been at places where I'm kind of overwhelmed and I'm, I'm nervous and I'm around. I'm around people I admire and respect, but I also want to uh, do what I do, you know, and mm -hmm. um, you can, you kind of get, you kind of get that uh, anxiousness. And like you said, you'd go back to the room and just kind of crash. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think that kind of feeling of overwhelmness uh, from something going on kind of pushed this into you, you know, that kind of made you somewhat, uh, start relating the the lady in the television to your mother to my mom I think so and plus you know this was um February February or March of 2017 and there were there was it was an unsettling time um politically for for me <laughs> I mean for you know for people of my political persuasion um and it was an unsettling time and there were a lot of marches going on um in DC. And I was really struck with this woman on the TV talking so much about strangers, you know, don't open the door for strangers, don't open the door for strangers, because um, I just found it very ironic in terms of my own life, because my mother in many ways was a stranger, you know, so when I think about, oftentimes, we think about strangers as being out there, you know, people that are, you know, it might be easy to say, oh, they're different um, before we, you know, get to know them. But my mother, you know, as I said earlier, I think there's, um, there's a chance she 
if she had lived at a different time, she would have chosen to spend her life with, with a woman, but she was born in 1928. And it, um, and she said very matter of factly to me once it just wasn't an option. Um, so that sense of her almost being estranged from herself, um, also, she suffered from alcoholism. You know, that's a talk about being estranged from your body, you know, the way she just kind of um, abused it and couldn't, you know, once she got to a certain point, could not help herself. Um, and so I was really struck with that, that tension of having this woman say, you know, be careful of strangers, be careful of strangers, and that all this political rhetoric about, you know, let's keep strangers out of the country. And I was just thinking a lot about my mom, you know, what does that even mean <laughs> to talk about a stranger? Yeah. It's, well, it's almost like you were, you were taking that as a, um, well, I need to be alert even in my own home. Exactly. With exactly. My, with my mother. Um, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, so on to grief, talk about, talk about grief. So I think, you know, as I said, I have this kind of obsession with my mother. And I think obsession sometimes can sound like a negative word. I mean it in a very positive way. Um, I think about her so much. I feel so close to her. Um, and I think that's what this poem is speaking to that yeah there was a lot of pain in in the relationship she had with herself and in our in, in the relationship she had with me because I would often you know try to get her to stop drinking and that didn't that didn't go over so well um but I think what the poem you know is is getting at is just how how present both the pain and the joy still are and I think the key line in this poem for me is there's no such thing as a half-life for grief you know, people sometimes talk about, oh, there's these five stages of grief, and then it'll all be, I think it's five, it'll all be cool after that. But um, I don't, you know, that's not, that's not really how it works. Like, um, I, I think anyone who's lost someone um, who they were very close to, uh, that grief doesn't ever go away completely. And I, and I think of the grief as a gift. I'm so glad to have this grief because it means it speaks to the deep connection that mm -hmm. I had with her. You know, I would hate to not have grieved <laughs> over the loss of my mother. But do, do you feel like you knew the, 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 do you feel like you knew the real person, the real? So person? this, or does anybody know anybody? Yeah. Th right. Well, yeah, I think. No, <laughs> we don't. I mean, I think lots of times we don't even know ourselves. But um, I, uh, my mother was an avid letter writer. Um, she wrote to me and my, well, to two, me and two of my siblings. My fourth sibling never left the Chicago area, really. So she didn't write letters as much to him. But um, I recently reread 180 letters that my mother wrote to me over a period of, um, I think it's 12 years. This And I, I rediscovered these in 2001, so last January. Um, and I those letters were transformational because reading those letters, it was as if my mom was present with me right, right there in the room. And there was no slurred speech. There were no blurry eyes. She wasn't looking past me. It was just pure presence and so much, so much love coming out of those letters. And oftentimes she was just writing about very mundane things, you know, what she had for dinner. Um, but when my mom died in 2001, there was a sense in which that grief was a little bit muted because she had already kind of left the family, um, you know, just because of her alcoholism. So I feel like those letters have just given me new insight into her and new love for her, a new appreciation. Um, so I keep learning about her. And then uh, in December, I found letters that um, she had written in the 50s to her like sister-in-laws and brother-in-laws um, 
And those two are giving me just lots of insight on her. And she was, she was this amazing woman. But um, when I, you know, when I was a teenager and on into my twenties, it's like all I could see was mm-hmm. you're drinking, you're drinking. And so I feel like my appreciation for her is just really expanding. That's great. I have a comment from uh, Trish Gartland on here. It says, tears and so happy you had that connection with your mom. I cry every day missing mine. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I actually, um, I don't know. I'm just going to say this in case it's helpful to anyone, but because it's helpful to me, I recently started writing letters to my mom about um, two months ago, and it has been so healing. Um, and then I just file them away, you know, in a folder. But um, I, when I sit there and write a letter to her, I just feel like she's there. And it's, I've, sometimes I consider myself to be a failed um, journaler, you know, someone who sits and writes in their journal every day, which apparently is, you know, what you're supposed to do if you're a writer. And um, I just, you know, I go through these phases where I write in my journal, and then I don't, and it's always been a struggle for me. Well, writing these letters to my mom is not a struggle. Like it's something I need to do. And, and I feel like it helps. And I'm, I'm writing about the same things I would probably write, you know, in a journal entry, but I think it helps to have that someone to write to, you know, to have that focus. So um, yeah, that's the, I feel like I've entered this new, um, new phase of the relationship with my mother. Cause I'm, I feel like I'm just going to be writing to her the rest of my life. And I'm so, I'm so thankful to her that she taught me how, well, just the art of letter writing, you know, and how it really can, it can bring people back. Be, I mean, I love knowing what my mother had for dinner in 1992, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon in June, it feels so vivid to me. So, yeah, I can see where that could bring you, bring the connection in. That's, mm-hmm. that's great. Oh, so Ars Poetica. Yes. So, uh-oh, something just happened. Oh, there, sorry. Something on my computer just happened. It's fine now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there, there was a lot of... Um, uh, doubt. I mean, not doubt, but people like I, I, I was, the, I'm the youngest of four and I'm the one who, um, was probably most affected by my mom's alcoholism because I was just 10 when she started drinking and, um, you know, some of my siblings were, were older. Um, but there was so much denial in the family about it. Um, so much denial. And so it was really hard to be that voice that is saying, look, this is happening. This is happening. And to, and to not be believed um, and to not be listened to. So, I mean, that's really what this is getting at that um, this, that it was just kind of a formative experience growing up for me to, to not be, believed. And I feel like I just have this need to write about it now. Um, and, and her death, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't natural. It was something that, um, you know, she did to herself and that we as a family did not kind of rally around to help her. Um, because, I, I don't know what, what my dad's reasons were for, you know, kind of enabling her and that's all very complicated and, um, um, and rooted in a lot of, a lot of pain, but nevertheless, yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of denial. I, um, recently also in December came across a letter that my mom's physician wrote to my mom, to my mom and my dad in 1999, so two years before my mother died, my doctor was pleading with my mother in this letter saying, you've got to get help. It's not too late. The time is now, like over and over again, the time is now, the time is now. Um, 
And obviously she didn't, they didn't go that route. Um, but the fact that my father, my father had to be moved into a dementia facility in December. And so we were kind of going through boxes. Um, the fact that he kept that letter for over 20 some years, um, I think really speaks to this idea that it, just how complicated it is. It's very complicated. I've had, uh, you know, I don't know why we don't uh, understand that, that I don't know why we don't keep it with us as adults that you know what's going on as a child, you feel it, you know, something's wrong. And, you know, I don't know why as we get older, we try to hide those things that you know your child is feeling. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't, get yeah. it. I don't get it either. So I got a couple yeah. of comments. Um, yeah. Foster, I've written letters to my mom as well. A therapist <gasps> suggested it to help with my grief. Then he asked me to read them aloud. That was very difficult, but very healing. Hi, Angie. Um, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, I'm so glad that they're healing for you. And I hope you keep doing it if it's if it continues to be healing. Um, that's so interesting that. Yeah, that you had to read them out loud. I, I um, Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about reading them out loud. Yeah, it's it make, it's another level of Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like it would really bring the person back. Like they're right there in that room then. Yeah. And another oh. from Sherry Weiner, Lisa, I lost my mom to early onset Alzheimer's and there were so many things to say to her. We talked about the impact early on. Writing to her would be so helpful. Oh, that's beautiful. So, yeah, you know, sounds like that's a good, good plan. Uh, yeah, yeah. For everyone wanting to... uh understand their mom more or say the things they never said or or got to say or even though you talked about it before when it when it happens and you're in it it's it's still right but even though you know you've talked about talked about it before um, absolutely yeah yeah so um we've got more readings i yes. also wanted to let you know that i thought um there was one poem in here I wanted to mention before we move in on to the end of the book. Um, it's in it's in actual water lessons, the poem water lessons, and it's the um, it's the uh, imagery or it's the sound and imagery of the ice and the glass. Oh yeah, I really I really like that one. That that really. Uh, Oh yeah, I mean that, and I and I think I've heard from other people who grew up in alcoholic families or families where someone was alcoholic um, that that the sound of ice in rattling around in a glass is it's a trigger for them, and I it's a huge trigger for me. I mean, I would be in my in my bedroom as a kid, you know, with the door closed, and I would. I, my bedroom was right near the back stairs and my mom would go down the back stairs, fill her glass in the pantry and then come up and I would just hear that, it. hear that noise. Um, and it's, um, yeah, I mean, even if I hear someone with like ice water mm. or soda pop or something with it today, like it still brings back that, that memory. Yeah. Well, now we're going to go to, um, we're going to move over to uh, your father. Yes. Battles with uh, dementia. Yes. So, so three readings um, that that's going to get into this. And um, it, it's called uh, one. The first is new bird. The second is daughter poem. And the third is I love. Yeah. Great. Go, go okay. Ahead. New bird. There's a new bird at the feeder. My stepmother notices its size, smaller, she says, than a vireo or chickadee. My sister sees white on the wing. I notice its beak slender like a warbler's. I open Peterson's field guide to birds and then, because it's November, turn to confusing fall warblers. Four entire pages as if confusion were its own species. My father is with us, eating cinnamon crunch. He's a child again, dementia changing his mind daily. 
He's sweeter now, milder than I've ever seen him. His own father died when he was 16, Thanksgiving Day, 1943. Sudden sickness of the heart, the paper said, above the outlook for feed supplies and cattle costs. The only time I've seen my father cry was during the sound of music when Captain Von Trapp uses an army whistle to summon his children. My father and stepmother own seven bird books, paperback, hardback, one signed by Peterson, another inscribed by my brother in 79, Dear Mom, Merry Christmas. My stepmother at 92 says, Please take one. My father, also 92, says, buy your own book. His way of saying he's not dead yet. He doesn't know he has dementia. We watch TV together. He loves the commercials. In one, a turkey drives a golf cart, relaxes at the beach, reads a magazine. Gone cold turkey, the voice says, and the turkey does a dance, kicking its feet in the air. A drug has curbed the turkey's cravings for cigarettes. My father thinks the turkey is real. You can tell by the eyes, he says. During a commercial about Alzheimer's, he doesn't say a word. The bird at the feeder is real. We can tell by its hunger, its flight. My father keeps eating his cereal. My sister takes a picture of the bird clicking as quickly as she can, but the bird is faster and the picture is a confusion of wings, a blur which could be its own thing. There's a story about God being bored. When God's companions suggest a game of hide and seek, they, lear they learn how good God is at hiding. My father is different now. Is he more himself or less? I like him this way. I like the bird at the feeder, its confusion of flight and hunger. I like the turkey driving a golf cart, kicking its feet up. My father was as afraid of his own father as I was of mine. I want to believe in love. I want to believe there is more love somewhere. Um. And then this is daughter poem. So my wife and I experienced a failed adoption uh, about 17 years ago. Daughter poem. Sometimes I see her pressing her palms against a window pane in a house that is real, the way a house in a dream is real until you start to describe it. And all you can say is, it was this house, only it wasn't. It's winter and she likes to feel the cold entering her body or it's summer and it's heat she's after. She wasn't born so she can't die. Sometimes there is a window but no girl and I am the one walking towards it. Sometimes I see her peering in forehead against the screen of our back door or running ahead of me on a path that is real the way a path in a dream is real saying this way this way and then the very last poem in the book is called I love I love how my wife says operators are standing by whenever I'm out of town and she wants to chat I love that birds can see stars and that even fruit flies need sleep I love that an African gray parrot learned how to use 100 words and that his last words were, be good and I love you. I love how Jesus stopped a crowd of men from stoning a woman just by writing in the sand. I love that an octopus has three hearts. I love that Mother Teresa only heard from God one time and it was enough. I love that some birds mate for life and that after one dies, the survivor sings both parts of their song. I love that our brains are mostly water. I love that some people believe in heaven and some don't. I love that an owl visited my wife in a dream and that my wife said hello and asked, are you the kind of owl that people refer to as a barred owl? I love that what saves one person is not the same as what saves someone else. I love how the word cranium sounds like the name of a flower. 
I love that my mother keeps wanting to show me her garden. I love that the owl answered back. And can I just say something about the new bird poem? Because I know that um, people have very different experiences with uh, when a parent has has dementia or Alzheimer's. And I, um, my father, if you might have guessed from the poem, was um, difficult, had a lot of anger, a lot of pain. Um, and I, so my experience with dementia has been different. And I've, the more people I talk to about this, I'm realizing I'm definitely not the only person, but um, my father has become so sweet and I wouldn't wish dementia on anyone, but I am so grateful for this time. I mean, I want to be in my father's presence in a, in a way now that when I was growing up, it was challenging. So I say that because it's just, um, it's, it's a very different People have very different experiences. So um, it really is kind of um, this kind of mixed blessing to have him. So it's, it, he, it's enjoyable. Yes. And he, he's not, um, I mean, he's well taken care of. Um, I mean, he's, he, it's, that's been going on for five years. So it's getting to a point where, you know, it's, it's um, getting rougher, but um he he still has a sense of humor. Um, he doesn't always make sense, but he's able to make um, jokes still, which is amazing. And he lives near, he's in a dementia facility right near my sister. So she visits him every day. Um, so, and then I've been going to visit him more and, and it feels like just a very, in some ways, a very sweet, time to just want to spend this time with my father when, um, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of issues. We, he and I had a lot of issues because he kept saying, you know, your mother is fine. And, um, and I kept saying, no, she's not. So this, um, yeah, it feels a little bit like a blessing. So I have a question. Do, do you think he's feeling a positive experience as well? Well, that's the thing. I mean, he seems, I, I, uh, as, as, as I said, it's getting a little to that point now where it's probably not fun, going to be fun for anyone. But, um, in those early years, like up until maybe, I don't know, really up until maybe three or four months ago, I mean, um, he's, he gets a lot of family visits. He's, um, has a sense of humor. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that he's completely happy, but he wasn't completely happy before. He had a lot of um, a lot of pain, a lot of pain for sure. So it, it, um, is this when he started? Um, when this uh, uh, onset dementia came about, was this when he he actually uh, admitted or let you know that um, the part about being scared of his father? As, oh, so as that was scared of your father. So that was actually um, about ten years ago. I was visiting him, and he was talking about how scared he was of his of his father. Um, and I almost blurted out, like it was this moment of almost this moment of bonding. And I almost said, "Oh my gosh, Dad, same here." Before I realized, I'm talking to my father. Um, but it was also this moment where I felt so much compassion, like no one comes out of the womb, you know, angry and, um, full of, full of pain. He clearly had a lot of, he had clearly had a difficult relationship with his own father, which helps me to understand, um, my relationship with him so much better. And I, you know, I have so much love for him, um, he is someone that can make me has always been able to make me laugh more than more than anyone. And he's so he has so many good qualities, but it was it was challenging. You know, I was one of those people that woke, that grew up um, feeling like I had to walk around on eggshells all the time because of this this anger. So. Um, so I'm not saying like he's this happy camper now that he has dementia, but he was in a a pretty 
difficult state even before that. Well, someone what? said um, it's it's as if maybe he was able to let go of. Yes. Like he doesn't know why he was so angry anymore. He doesn't remember. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah, exactly. Hopefully exactly. that's a blessing for him. For him. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. Good deal. Well, thank you for everything. Um, you can get water lessons um, on Amazon. Uh huh. Um, or at, you can order from your local bookstore as well. Like a and Parnassus. Yes, Par Parnassus or the, the bookshop in East Nashville. And can I also just say it is currently half price directly from the press, blacklawrencepress.com, um, in honor of, of National Poetry Month. So just between now and April 30th, it's half price. Great. Well, thanks for sharing everything with us. And um, Thank you so much, Lee. Great. And Keep in touch and, um, you know, as you progress and uh, what do you see? Do you see, uh, are you at a point where I don't know if another book will come or. I do have another, I do have another book. So um, thank you for asking me that. So in September of 2023, I have another book coming out. It's called Next Time You Come Home. And it's, it's based on my mom's letters. Mm -hmm. So, and, and my mom's name is going to be on the cover alongside with mine, because what I did was I. I typed up those 180 letters. Um, it was 110,000 words <laughs> and I distilled everything down to it's now like 9,000 words. And I shaped her letters into these kind of mini poems. Um, and my mom always wanted to be a writer, but it never, it never really worked out. So um, I'm just so excited. I can't wait to hold a book that has her name on it um, right alongside mine and uh, yeah, and some of her last words in one of her last letters uh, were next time you come home. You know, I'll show you this next time you come home. And then she died a couple of weeks later. So, um, yeah, that's a book that um, I think I could just I don't know if it'll if other people will love it, but I could just read it over and over again because it brings her back. Yeah. Well, as soon as you can come back and share it with us. I will. Thank you so much, Lee. So, uh, comments or thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful poetry and storytelling. So thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. We'll stay in touch and uh, I hope everything goes well and you sell lots of books and uh, let us know what we can do to help you. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you. Okay. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.